Welcome again to this webisode on the monastic life. I presented the monastic life as a life which seeks God and His kingdom. And there are eight aspects of such a life. The first aspect is the spirit life and we tried to explain this in terms of the vocation, the calling of God. The, God, the monk is called by God to glorify God, to dwell in the tents of the kingdom, to avail of the blessings of the kingdom and to attain perfect charity. And uh, we tried to explain the meanings of this uh, uh, specifics of the calling of the Lord. And we went into the response of the monk. After that, we tried to take a look at the prayer life of the monk, and that's what we did yesterday. Well, our apologies for, uh, I think there were some parts of the uh, presentation of the Eucharist as the apex and the highest point, the summit of the prayer life of the monk because of the internet connections. In today's webisode, we try to take a look into the third aspect of that life which seeks God and His kingdom, and it is discipline life. So, spirit life, prayer life, now we go into the discipline life. Another name for discipline is asceticism. Asceticism is derived from the Greek word askesis, A-S-K-E-S-I-S, -S, which corresponds to the Latin exercitium, or exercise. So, ascesis, exercisium or exercise, entails certain efforts, certain efforts to maintain physical equilibrium, so physical health. To cultivate personality. in the different uh, aspects of personality, intellectual, psychological, moral, spiritual, and to cultivate outward behavior. So to maintain physical equilibrium, to cultivate personality, and to cultivate outward behavior. Well, today, uh, in many places all over the country, you have the Zumba. It's a physical exercise for women, especially those who are growing bigger, and also for men. Uh, from the highway of the road going to the Barangay Puro, which is now uh, cemented well every morning there are uh, men and women doing jogging or brisk walking physical exercise to maintain uh, physical equilibrium the equilibrium of the body 
in the personal, in the cultivation of personality or personality development, we have intellectual exercises. Moral, spiritual, and then even our uh, uh, outward behavior, that has to be cultivated. And there are certain ways that we have to follow for good manners, right conduct, social graces, and so on. Now, what is the goal of ascesis? What is the goal of discipline or asceticism? What is the goal of uh, uh, ex exercise? Exercitium. The goal of the exercise is to make the monk capable of receiving the touch of the spirit. So the, the touch of the spirit. And so these exercises uh, dispose us to receive the touch of the spirit. Not only that, the goal is to uh, prepare the monk for encounters with the Lord, encounters with the Lord, and to attune him to the ways of God and to the will of God. In short, the exercise the personal discipline, asceticism, is geared at seeking God through the following and imitation of Christ. So the, the monks, uh, asceticism or personal discipline is an active expression of his nostalgia for the passion of Jesus Christ, the perfect model of the Father's love. And as uh, St. Benedict says in chapter 7 of the Rule 69, through this personal discipline, he hopes to arrive at the power to act for the love of Christ. Now let me uh, present to you now the different uh, dimension, dimensions of the personal discipline, asceticism of the monk. There are three dimensions of the personal discipline or the personal asceticism or the personal exercises of the monk. The bodily, mental, and spiritual. So body, mind, and spirit. And the bodily, mental, and spiritual uh, dimensions of the personal discipline of asceticism constitute the so-called monastic observances. Monastic observances. And these monastic observances are all for the sake of the kingdom, all for the love of Christ. Now let's take a look at this. A triple dimension now. The body, the soul or the mind, and the spirit. So, well, we know the various dimensions of our body, the bodily uh, elements. We have the sense of taste. Sleep. And the tongue, uh, 
the mobility of the body, uh, its sexual desires and urges, and then bodily ease. Uh, well, the, the eyes have their own allurements, the ears, and uh, uh, body postures. Yeah, all these are to be subjected to physical exercises. And what are the monastic observances that correspond to this uh, ninefold elements of the body I mentioned. The discipline or the monastic observance to cultivate and to discipline our sense of taste is fasting and abstinence. Now, by the way, all Fridays of the year are fasting days. Yeah, no, no, what? No, rather, abstinence days. Good Friday is fast and abstinence, and Ash Wednesday is fast and abstinence. But all the Fridays of the year are abstinence days. So the monastic observance of fasting and abstinence is uh, geared to control our taste. Not uh, the love for sleep. Oh, there are some people who sleep so long. They go to bed at 8 and they wake up at 8 or they wake up at 7. But according to oh, health science, 7 to 8 hours of sleep a day would be good enough for health. Oh, but some people just sleep long. If you go to bed at 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. If you wake up at 7 o'clock, it's 10 hours too long. No discipline of the uh, tendency to sleep. I know some people who sleep long. When they wake up, they have headache. Because headache is not only undersleeping but oversleeping. It's too much pampering of the body. So the monastic observance to discipline the tendency of the body for sleeping is vigils. And that's why the monks uh, rise early enough. In many monasteries, they wake up at 2.15, some at 3.15, some at 4. But of course, they go to bed early. Well, uh, you must still remember the, the rhyme you oh, memorized in the grade school. I memorized it when I was in grade two. Early to bed and early to rise makes James healthy and wise. If you oversleep, or maybe your body becomes bigger, but not healthy, and neither are you wise. So the vigils, the poor clairs, for example, they wake up at 12 o'clock midnight to pray for one hour, it's vigils. Because in the monastic uh, uh, doctrine, the night is not meant only for sleeping. Part of the hours of the night should be spent in prayer, and that prayer is called vigils. 
Well, you do that even for natural reasons. For instance, on the last night of the wake of your beloved dead, the members of the family and the neighbors who, who go to the house of the dead man or woman, they don't sleep and they call that last canvassing. What do they do? They gamble. Now, what is the monastic observance to control, to discipline the tongue? Silence. Or uh, taciturnity, as Benedict called it, the moderation of speech. If you are the person, the type of the person who utters 1,000 words per minute, oh, that's verbal diarrhea. You might as well control that. Talking for the sake of talking, and sometimes talking nonsense. The monastic observance is silence, or the moderation of speech called by Benedict taciturnity. How about the tendency of the body to keep on moving? Oh, well, there are some people, you know, during Holy Mass, during the liturgy of the Word, oh, sometimes I see them because I stay in front. They, didn't, they cannot even keep quiet during Mass. They're shaking their legs. Which according to oh, psychologists, that's psychological masturbation. And just they can't keep quiet. And they just can't keep to a still point. Or they keep on scratching their bodies. Actually, there's nothing that's itchy. So the monastic observance to control this tendency of the body to keep on moving and moving is stability. And the cloister of the monastery is meant for that stability. I recall I was invited to give a retreat to one contemplative community of nuns in the Philippines. And the superior told me, Father, will you give a conference on uh, keeping still the still point especially during prayer. And I was wondering why the superior asked me to give a conference on that. Then she told me, oh, well, you know, my sisters, during meditation time in the morning, I allow them to, to choose a place where they can meditate. But then in the, in the monastic compound, it's very, very uh, uh, limited. Our monastery is situated on a less than a hectare monastery and so uh, the, the area is beautifully landscaped so we have uh, small gazebos beautifully landscaped and one sister or the other she moves from one gazebo to other gazebo and for the 30 minutes meditation i don't know how many movements she made from one gazebo to the other so we'll just speak about still point in prayer stability. By the way, uh, someone who is monitoring my faith education series and my uh, homilies, he told me that my conference on stability is now number two. And this friend told me it might go to number one, listening audience-wise in not so long a time. So, you see, we feel the need for stability. Uh, somebody told me in a contemplative community of nuns, the, the priests uh, take turns to, to go to their uh, community and celebrate Mass. So, for the seven days of the week, there are different, seven different priests who go there. And one of the sisters told this friend of mine, 
Well, it's nice because there is a variety of homilies. Is the sister after the variety or after the doctrine or after the Word of God? Then the tendency of the body, its sexual desires and urges. What is the monastic observance to control this? It's celibacy, celibate chastity. That's the monastic observance. And uh, we want to give way to the hunkering of the body for ease, easy living. We don't want our complexion to be tanned by the sun. And what is the monastic observance? destined to control the body's tendency for towards ease is manual work and poverty. Now oh, there was someone who came here who tried to live the life of a monk. He does not work. He keeps on walking from one place to the other as if he were the overseer, the kapatas of the work in the in the field, no, manual work. And so someone who is lazy and who does not want to do manual work is definitely not for the monastery. Well, the tendency of the eyes to look around And the monastic observance uh, enjoined by Benedict is as eyes cast down. And that's why, you know, the, the hood that we are wearing this hood is meant to control the eyes from roaming around. They're like the control of the horse's eyes, both left and right, so that the horse will run towards one single direction. So this is meant to control the eyes moving around and looking at places, at people, etc. And what is the monastic observance for the ears? Refrain from hearing idle, nonsensical talks. Let's say, for example, Benedict enjoys the monk when he goes out for some uh, necessary work outside the clo cloister that he's not supposed to be telling news about what he has seen and observed and heard outside. And uh, the posture of the body, well, sitting, walking, standing uh, properly. I remember when I was in the trapeze, one brother, a lay brother who finished on the high school, made a comment during our shared homily. Because there were just some monks who, or during the prayer especially, when we were standing, that they were not properly positioned. And then this brother started to, you know, to demonstrate, well, you know, some monks, when they stand, they have this position, in that position, and sometimes when they sit, well, the brother is a is a 
Visayan. They sit down with open legs that move us all to laughter. So the discipline, the monastic observance of the posture of the body is proper way of sitting, proper way of walking, proper way of standing. So those are what we call the monastic observances uh, geared towards the discipline of the different aspects of the body. Fasting and abstinence to discipline the taste, vigils, time spent at night for prayer to discipline the desire to sleep and sleep and sleep and sleep and sleep long. Silence to discipline the tongue. The stability, the cloister to discipline the tendency to keep on moving around. And celibacy or celibate chastity to discipline the bodily sexual urges. And uh, manual work and poverty to discipline the hunkering of the body after ease and for the discipline of the eyes that want to move around and to reconnoiter people and places then eyes cast down to discipline the ears well, refrain from idle talks and proper way of sitting, standing, kneeling to discipline the uh, different postures of the body. So that is the uh, personal discipline of the monks when it comes to his body. And these are called monastic observances. Now, what about the discipline of the soul? By the way, the soul, man's soul has two powers, two faculties, thinking and willing, thinking and choosing, or thinking and loving. So the discipline of the intellect and the will, or the monastic observance, of destined to discipline the intellect and the will is Lectio Divina, sacred reading. And special prayers added to the accustomed prayer service of the monastery. So the Lectio Divina disciplines your intellect. By the way, in any field of uh, knowledge or science, even if it is your own field of expertise, if you do not read, you simply deteriorate. Now let me tell you, at this point in time, I'm 81 years old. I still spend two hours of reading every day. Now how about the spirit? Well, the spirit means uh, that power to relate with God and with the world of the spirit, with the with the angels, with the saints, how is that spirit disciplined? Well, it is disciplined by the virtues of obedience that disciplines the self-will, humility, patience, perseverance, 
willpower and especially punctuality. Yeah, for instance, uh, I always make it a point in my appointments, whatever they are, I always make it a point to begin them as punctual as possible. Unless, for instance, like this uh, uh, 10 o'clock uh, Facebook, face, faith education, unless something gets wrong with the signal of the internet or something gets wrong with the camera or the laptop. But I would always want to begin things on time. So that's personal discipline. The personal uh, exercise or the certain efforts of the monk to maintain physical equilibrium, to cultivate personality in its different aspects like uh, intellectual, psychological, moral, spiritual, and to cultivate outward behavior. Let's go to the second aspect of discipline, which is social discipline. Well, monastic life in the Laura tradition entails a group or a colony of uh, hermits living close to each other. Even for this kind of monastic living in the Laura tradition, a certain social discipline is needed. And then monastic life in its Cenobitic tradition that is lived in community needs social discipline to preserve the order and functioning of the monastic life, to preserve the order and function of the monastery and to uh, oh, correct vices and negligences. and to lead the monks to a change of behavior and attitude, resulting in a deeper conversion or penance. In order to let the baptismal grace blossom to its fullest possible development and to participate in the sufferings of Christ. These objectives serve at the same time as spiritual motivations for social discipline. Now let's uh, take a look at the uh, historical context of the social discipline or the social monastic observances. The end of the age of martyrs mark the beginning of the way of penance. And the monks, whether of the Laura tradition or the Cenobite tradition, came forward as the white martyrs during the age of persecution. Those who were persecuted and who were killed were called red martyrs. Now, with the coming of the monks, they came forward as white martyrs. And they sought the perfection of the baptismal life through cultivating the way of penance. For the monks, baptism was the penitentia prima, the first baptism. And the way of penance came as the second penance. And 
they saw in their austere life a perpetuation, a continuation of the spirit of the martyrs who achieved the fullness of Christian life and hope by crowning their baptism in water with baptism in blood. So those were the martyrs. Now, when the uh, age of penance came, so they hoped to crown their uh, baptismal grace, not anymore with the waters of, of uh, persecution, but with the waters of penance. And uh, during the third century, AD. The West developed a rather a penitential practice as a public act within the church's liturgy under the watchful uh, custody of the hierarchy of the church. By the end of the fourth century, Penitential practices began to decline because they became too demanding. Some denied altogether the power of the church to forgive sins. On the other hand, popes issued decrees allowing for the reduction of public penances while maintaining it for specially serious sins which were still considered forgivable, forgivable only once after baptism and extremely hard sanctions were imposed upon them. Now, when Benedict came in, this was the time of the barbarization of society. The, those who entered the monasteries then were not really quite civilized and uh, they were rude, some kind of barbarians in quotation marks. So what did Benedict do? He brought together the best and most balanced disciplinary measure of the church's tradition and practice. The result was a well-formed alliance of asceticism and moderation, motivated by the Christian life and as lived in a monastery and as founded in Revelation. Now let's... Uh, Take a look at these forms of social discipline then, and this time during the time of Benedict. The first is what they call excommunication. This excommunication has nothing to do with the excommunication of canon law. So this has no bearing at all with the excommunication of canon law. Rather, the excommunication of the rule means uh, any of the following. Exclusion from the common table for lighter faults. So the monk was not allowed to eat with the monks when they come together for meals at the refectories. Exclusion. That was called communication. Or uh, they were not allowed to participate in the divine office. So they were not allowed to take their places at the choir. So that's uh, also another form of excommunication. Or deprivation from general association with the community. So a kind of excommunication that this or that monk or these monks are not allowed to associate with the members of the community. That's uh, excommunication. 
or uh, as the rule in chapter 9 says, in the worst cases, even expulsion from the community. Uh, accompanying these uh, social forms of discipline are the abbots uh, love, prayer, and supervision through persons acting on the abbot's behalf. So that's excommunication as a social discipline. As I said, uh, this has no bearing at all with the excommunication of canon law. Another form of social discipline is uh, corporal punishment, bodily punishment. The barbarization of society during St. Benedict's time called for this kind of social discipline in the monasteries. But some monks came from the rank and file of barbaric society. And corporal punishment was meted out to those who would not amend without the threats of corporal punishment. Then there is what they call the corruptio, C-O-R-R-E-P-T-I-O. -R -R -E well, this might take the form of a reprimand, a rebuke, or a reproof. And the corruptio, the reprimand, is usually verbal in nature. Done in the presence of all the monks of the community or with the guilty alone. So those are some of the forms of social discipline then. It's communication as I have explained and then corporal punishment and rebuke corruption. Now, a monk who has committed a fault must acknowledge his fault. And this acknowledgement constitutes his interior disposition of humility. Then, he carries out the imposed penalties exterior disposition of humility, making it an appropriate penitential act intended to repair the harm or the damage caused by default in the one who has committed it and in a personal and the person injured. Yeah, for instance, uh, if you read the the story of the, the man who got even with God. What was the, the social uh, discipline imposed on him and what reparation or satisfaction he had to make? Well, he was assigned at the bakery for, of the monastery and there were more than 200 monks in Gethsemane. And the bread was overcooked. And so he had to, his punishment, the reparation was, he had to eat all of that burnt bread. I don't know how, for how many weeks did he, uh, was he eating the burnt bread and then at another time he carried you know so many dishes one on top the other and all of them fell down he had to uh, hold in front of him all the pieces the broken pieces of the of the uh, broken uh, dishes and he was asked by the abbot to go back to his family and ask for money for the community to buy new sets of dishes. 
wall. Now, why is reparation and uh, uh, satisfaction needed? Well, such penitential acts damage dispositions of relationships. So they had to be repaired. So such a penitential acts repair damage disposition, damage relationships. At the same time, such a penitential act eradicates pride in the offender and changes the offender by letting him enter into himself to uproot the source of evil within him and by correcting his behavior. Oh, well, today it's so difficult, you know, for postmodern man. There's always a reason, there's always an alibi for anything and everything. And he refuses to be corrected, to be reprimanded. So this is the disciplined life of the monk. First, it is a personal discipline destined to control the bodily oh, inclinations of the monk. So we have uh, fasting and abstinence, a monastic observance to control his uh, love for food and drinks, taste, vigils, to control his uh, well, desire to sleep and sleep and sleep and sleep long. Then silence to control his tongue. The cloister stability to control his uh, uh, mobility, his desire to move from one place to the other. And then chastity, celibate chastity to discipline the sexual urges of the body. And uh, uh, manual work and poverty to discipline the love of the body for uh, ease, for comfort, and then eyes cast down to discipline the uh, different directions towards which the eyes move, and then refrain from hearing idle talks to discipline the ears and proper body postures. And the uh, soul dimension, in terms of the intellect and the will, Lectio Divina, and uh, added prayers to the accustomed service, and the discipline of the uh, spirit, obedience, humility, patience, perseverance, willpower, uh, punctuality, and truth. Now the social discipline, we have seen the context when it was prompted by the barbarization of society because those who entered the monasteries came from, were brought in by, in the context of the barbaric society, they came from such a, a society and therefore social disciplines were necessary in the forms of excommunication, in the form of corporal punishment and rebuke. And whatever, there was a necessary satisfaction or reparation to be made, to be done by the monk, because this repairs damaged relationships, eradicates pride in the offender, and makes the offender uh, come to a kind of a change by letting him enter into himself 
to uproot the source of evil within him and correcting his behavior. I had always maintained myself for my life and for others. Without discipline, nothing can come out of our life. Without discipline, I don't see the possibility of any good, greater or smaller, that will come out of our life. In whatever field of life, even in studies, without intellectual discipline, nothing doing. And today, we live in an age of permissiveness, of laxity, and even uh, too much freedom, license in the name of license, to do the things that we would like to do, even if we know they do not correspond to uh, morality and to truth. Now, whatever uh, of the kinds of uh, personal discipline and whatever the monastic observances uh, deign to meet the needs of the body of the monk for discipline or the needs of the soul for discipline the needs of the spirit for discipline, whatever you try to find your own context. But by all means, you have to convince yourself that without a disciplined life, nothing, will, nothing much good will come out of your life. Well, uh, you can read uh, at uh, street corners, on highways, this uh, saying, sa ikauunlad ng bayan, disiplina ang kailangan. For the progress of the country, discipline is a must. For the progress of your spirit life, and for the progress of your prayer life, discipline is a must. Without discipline, I cannot see much good accruing from your uh, personal life, your spirit life, your prayer life. We need this kind of discipline, the constant and consistent exercises destined to, con to control our bodies, our minds, our will, and our spirit. As I said in the beginning, they are needed to make us open, capable of receiving the touch of the Spirit, the touch of God. And these exercises prepare us for encounters with the Lord and they attune us to the ways of God, to the will of God. In short, discipline is geared at seeking God through the following and imitation of Christ. Let's make it then a point to live a disciplined life uh, in the dimensions of our bodies, within dimensions of our intellect and will, and our spirit. And if we do live a life that is disciplined, we hope we can come to God and be attuned to His very life. The time is up now. I'll see you again tomorrow at the same time. And uh, we will continue our uh, uh, presentation of the life of seeking God in its eight dimensions. We finished already three, spirit life, prayer life, discipline life. 
tomorrow we'll talk about community life. Goodbye now and see you again tomorrow.